Well, your lazy TA is sleeping, but it's time for another introductory astronomy class with Bella, the cat, and me, Jamie Lombardi. Today we'll be recording Wednesday, April 15th lecture, and we'll be finishing up chapter 17, which is on the universe's Big Bang and the evolution of the universe. And then uh, we'll be talking at the end a little bit about a neat web page that you can use to hunt for satellites if you'd like to. Okay, so uh, to start out today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the astronomy picture of the day from a couple weeks ago. This is about the Atlas Comet. It's called Atlas C 2019Y4. 2019 because it was discovered in 2019. In fact, it was the last comet that was discovered by Atlas. Atlas is Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System. And so this is something that scours the skies looking for asteroids, and in this case a comet, which could be moving in the ecliptic plane, potentially impacting the Earth. And so this is one of the mechanisms that we have in place to try to catch these things um, so that we can be prepared and hopefully someday be able to do something about it, like we've discussed earlier in the class. Comets are more dangerous than asteroids because they can come out of nowhere. This particular comet, Atlas, has a 6,000 year orbital period. So this has not been seen in modern times. Um, and it was a very exciting find, and it still is. However, uh, in the last few days, it's been discovered that Atlas is breaking up. And so originally it was thought to be uh, something that would probably rival the brightness of Venus in the sky. It never did get that bright. A few days ago, it started to disintegrate and break up into at least three different pieces. Here I have um, a space.com article about it. And if you look carefully, you can start to see that that nucleus of the comet here is breaking up. There's the orbital path that this comet would have followed. You can see it's coming in. It would have actually gotten closer to the sun than Venus. Its point of closest approach, the perihelion, would have occurred uh, or, or maybe still will occur around May 31st, but it may break up completely before that. It's, it's hard to say. Had it remained, or if it remains as an object uh, on an elliptical orbit, uh, it would have gone back out again. So this is a highly eccentric elliptical orbit that we're looking at here. If we look back to the astronomy picture of the day, you can see the coma around it, and it was already starting to develop a little bit of a plasma or ion tail right there. Remember that points away from the sun. It's due to the solar wind hitting up against the atmosphere, the coma of that particular comet, and then pushing off the plasma back behind uh, away from the sun. Down in the lower right of the astronomy picture of the day, we see the galaxies M81 and M82. These are famous galaxies. They're easy to see with just a moderately sized telescope. They're each about 12 million light years away and they're gravitationally interacting with one another. Okay, so let's get into the material for today, back to chapter 17. And you'll remember at the end of the last class, we talked about recombination. And to quickly review, this is the first big piece of evidence that there was a Big Bang that when the electrons recombine down onto atoms, the light that had previously been trapped is now allowed to freely stream. And that freely streaming light has been moving through intergalactic space for the last nearly 13.8 billion years. Um, and we detect that light. If there had never been a Big Bang, maybe you take the view of the universe like Einstein did 100 years ago, that it was static and unchanging then there would be no reason to have had this moment of recombination and there would not have been this cosmic microwave background that permeates all of space. The fact that we see this cosmic microwave background radiation, this cosmic microwave background radiation, is evidence that there was this moment of recombination when the universe was much smaller. And so we're seeing, when we look at that light, the universe when it was only 380,000 years old, when it was um, at the beginnings of its evolution. 
We also started to mention last time Penzias and Wilson. These are the astronomers at Bell Labs in New Jersey. They had this new radio horn telescope that would search the sky for radio waves. And they uh, hooked it up, they calibrated it, and every direction that they pointed, they were getting radio waves from the sky. It was a background noise, and they did everything that they could do to try to get rid of it. Um, you know, they taped along uh, the lines in here. They cleaned out a white dielectric material is what they refer to it in one paper. That's also known as pigeon poop. They were good physicists. They, they redid the wiring on their experiment, but nothing they could find would make this radiation, this noise, this signal go away. And there was a chance encounter on an airplane which led one of them to call up Robert Dickey at Princeton University nearby. And Dickey and Peebles and others had been working and thinking about building a telescope, not, like, not unlike this one here, to look for a signal from that event of recombination, to look for that cosmic microwave background. They realized that if there was a Big Bang, that there should be this radiation, and they were getting ready to look for it. Penzias and Wilson beat them to the punch. Um, it said that uh, Dickey hang, hung up the phone after talking to him and said, well, we've been scooped. But they worked together. They shared information. They, in fact, uh, the two groups published papers side by side in 1965. Um, the Princeton group uh, published a paper on the causes of what that background radiation was. And Penzias and Wilson published a paper. Here's the title, A Measurement of Excess Antenna Temperature. And so in the end, uh, Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for their discovery. Uh, the Princeton group was left out of that particular award, um, but it is nevertheless a, uh, a very meaningful discovery because it gives us the first clear evidence for there having been a Big Bang. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this cosmic microwave background radiation. What we're looking at here is the sky, a full view of the sky in the microwave. And I'll talk in a moment a little bit more about how this image is made. But the idea is that no matter what direction you look, the temperature is remarkably close to a uniform value, around 2.7 Kelvin. But some regions are about one ten thousandth of a Kelvin hotter than other regions. And so the hottest regions in this diagram, this picture, are bright yellow. The coldest regions are black. And you can see there are very small scale fluctuations of this temperature. When you look at a picture like this, you are looking at the light that was emitted 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's impossible to take a picture of the universe that shows the universe any younger than this. Because before that moment, photons were trapped inside of the gas, inside of the, everything that made up the universe. And so this was the earliest picture you could take. It's a baby picture, so to speak. Here's a little video that'll give us more information about this kind of imagery here. Um, we'll start by taking this full sky and we will cut it apart and then spread it out onto that oval that we were just talking about. Now in this case, at this moment, we're looking at the sky in the visible. You can see here the plane of the Milky Way galaxy with the dusty lanes across it. That's the central bulge region. As you go up this way, you're looking higher. As you go down this way, you're looking lower. And that point on the far left is the same as a point on the far right of that oval. Now we can look at this in the microwave as well. And there we see the sky is very remarkably uniform in intensity. This radiation in the microwave is the same, almost exactly the same in all directions. There is, if you turn it up and look at very sensitive levels, a slight blue shifting towards this side of the universe and red shifting towards that side of the universe. In the last astronomy picture of the day, the one from our previous lecture, 
we saw this particular dipole distribution here. And it's due to the fact that the solar system is moving through that cosmic microwave background. And in the direction that it's moving into, we see the blue shifting of that light. And in the direction it's moving away from, there the light gets stretched out and we see the red shifting. Now, what you can do is you can also um, look at galactic sources. And so here, right along the central axis of this oval, we see a lot of uh, sources. These are stars and gas clouds and other celestial objects that are uh, contributing to the microwave. And you can take the full picture and break it up basically into three components. You've got um, the galactic sources, and not surprisingly here, they're all concentrated along the galactic plane. That's where most stuff is in our galaxy. You have the extra galactic sources from other galaxies. So every little smudge you see on here is a faraway galaxy that's contributing to the microwave. But then what's left over after you subtract these two out is this. And this is what we care about here. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so uh, all together, you see the mixture of these things, but you can subtract out the galactic and extra galactic sources to get that cosmic microwave background radiation. Let's go ahead and um, think about what this means. The fact that some parts of the universe way back then are a little bit hotter and some part are a little bit colder, that's showing us that the universe was already lumpy at that point. And that lumpiness is going to be the seeds of structures like clusters of galaxies and galaxies as the universe expands. All right, so first big piece of evidence was that there's a cosmic microwave background radiation that is explained by the Big Bang. The second big piece of information is that the Big Bang theory correctly predicts the abundance of helium and other elements. Remember we said that up until five minutes into the evolution of the universe, there was nucleosynthesis that created helium, helium-3, helium-4, and trace amounts of heavier things. Here's how that um, helium is generated. You have a proton and a neutron make a deuterium, two deuterium collide and make, uh, a, he um, make a hydrogen-3. That's pretty cool. One proton, two neutrons. That hydrogen-3 hits a deuterium to make um, a helium-4. It knocks out another neutron that could then later hit another proton. Now, there are other reaction chains that occur, right? You can make helium-3. You can even get higher fusion than this to make lithium-7 and beryllium-9. Um, but during that first five minutes, you are mostly converting hydrogen into helium. Before one one-thousandth of a second, Antimatter was too plentiful in the universe for this nucleosynthesis to take hold, but at one one thousandth of a second, that's when the antimatter and matter annihilated, making lots of photons, leaving behind that little bit of extra abundance of matter, which is the matter that we have today. Now, you may wonder how much helium is made. Well, the way that it works out is that by mass, if you look at primordial, that means untouched virgin gas clouds out there, you'll see that 75% of them by mass, 75% uh, of the mass is hydrogen, 25% of the mass is helium. So if you imagine starting with um, 14 protons and two neutrons, then two of those 14 protons will form with two of the neutrons using that process we looked at at the previous slide to make one helium. And these other 12 hydrogens, they don't have time to react before the five minutes is up and so you're left with 12 hydrogens and one helium. 12 hydrogens is basically three times as massive as one helium, since a neutron and a proton have about the same mass. And that leaves us with the 75% and 25% makeup. Now, as we'll be discussing, the models of the universe that, you, that best fit observations predict that you have that ratio of hydrogen to helium that 
you can run the physics through and we understand the physics well for those reaction rates. And we see that in the so-called consensus Big Bang model, the model that fits all these data that we'll discuss in more detail here, you make just the right amount of um, helium. Now, it's certainly possible to make models that make too much or too little helium, right? So what you can do is you can imagine adjusting how much ordinary matter exists in your universe. If you say it's not a very dense universe, not a lot of matter in it, you'd be over on this side, right? And if there's a very dense with ordinary matter universe, you'd be over on the far right side of the diagram. Well, if about four to five percent of the energy density in the universe is in ordinary matter, then we can um, look and see how much of these various elements, like deuterium, that's heavy hydrogen, is made. This is as you adjust the ordinary matter density in your model, you make less and less and less deuterium. This swath right here tells us the observed values of deuterium in primordial gas clouds. So if the density in your universe of ordinary matter is about four to five percent, the predicted value matches the observed value. Likewise for helium three, if the density of ordinary matter in your universe is about four to five percent, then you're right here at the top of the uh, upper limit for how much helium three is observed in the primordial clouds of the universe. And likewise, if you say the ordinary matter in the universe is about four to five percent of the energy density, then if you look, then up, oh, we're a little bit high on the predicted values of lithium seven. And there are astrophysicists out there that are spending their careers on trying to describe and explain that small discrepancy. Maybe it's an observational issue. Um, but the point is that with the Big Bang Theory, if there had not been a Big Bang, there's no reason you would have expected that these predictions would be even close to the observed values. We're giving a framework, a, an explanation for why these elements have the abundances that they do. Right? Here the abundances on the vertical axis are all relative to hydrogen. So this is the second big piece of evidence that the Big Bang Theory is able to predict the correct abundances of helium, helium-3 and 4, deuterium, lithium-7, and so on. Okay, here's a thought question for you. Let's say you look up at a gas cloud in the universe somewhere and you see an abundance pattern like one of the following. Which of these is unrealistic for a star? 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, 2% other, 95% hydrogen, 5% helium, less than 0.02% other. And by the way, don't get caught up on the fact that this adds up to 100.02%. Maybe one of these was 94.98%. You get the idea. 75%, um, 25%, 0.02% other, 72%, 27%, 1% other. Go ahead and pause it if you need to. Well, the idea here is that the universe after the Big Bang, after five minutes into it, is 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. And stars, they can convert hydrogen into helium and lower the hydrogen abundance. So although it may start at 75%, you may find a star that has 72% or 70% hydrogen. Any of that is possible because maybe that hydrogen has been converted into helium. But nature doesn't provide a way to refine the gas to make it a higher percentage of hydrogen because you start with 75% hydrogen and you can only go down from there as stars convert hydrogen into helium. So in section 17.3, we talk about the Big Bang and inflation. Remember we said at the end of the gut era, there's reasons to believe that there was this inflationary epoch where the universe got very large very quickly. And this inflation is gonna to help to explain um, some otherwise mysterious facts about our universe. Here are some questions that need answering. 
where does the structure in the universe come from? This is called the density non-uniformity problem. And the fact that there's galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Why is the overall distribution of matter so uniform? If I take a big chunk of space over there, it has the same amount of material in it on average as the same sized big chunk of space over here. And why is the overall density of the universe so close to the critical density? And we'll be defining that more carefully. But in a sense, this means that light will continue on straight lines. And if you put two light rays parallel to one another, they will continue to be parallel to one another. They won't cross, they won't go, they won't diverge from one another. The universe is flat, like a sheet of paper, so to speak. Now, as it'll turn out, an inflationary epoch will solve all three of these problems, answer all three of these questions. Where does the structure come from? Well, for whatever quantum mechanical reasons, there must have been small perturbations before inflation. And then inflation basically acts like a big magnifying glass that makes everything bigger. And so the regions in the universe that were a little bit under dense become really under dense. And the regions that were a little over dense become much more dense. And out of that, eventually, the voids of the universe will form from those under dense regions. And in the denser regions, that's where the galaxies and galaxy clusters are going to uh, collapse down in their formation as they form. So a tiny little quantum mechanical ripple before inflation can become something the size of a solar system after inflation. What about why the overall distribution of matter is so uniform? If you think about that cosmic microwave background radiation we've been discussing, it's rather surprising that if you look off in that direction, you see something that's 2.7 Kelvin. And if I look off in the other direction, 180 degrees apart from that, it's also 2.7 Kelvin. How did that side of the universe communicate with that side of the universe to conspire to be the same temperature? Here's what's called a space-time diagram. The horizontal axis is space, the vertical axis is time. We are right here at this point at the current time, but this vertical line is our so-called world line. Here's where we were in the past, or at least this location in space was in the past, and then it just keeps going on into the future. And if we're looking off to the left on this diagram, we see light that was emitted from way back when at the moment of recombination. So this little reddish line is representing light coming to us and ultimately being observed. If we had looked off to the right instead, light from the moment of recombination at little gas blob B is coming. It's moving towards us, so it's position and distance or space is changing as time goes forward and then it's observed here and these two gas blobs a and b must have been at the same temperature in order to be giving us now the same radiation that we see how is that well if you expand out and take a bigger picture and allow for an inflation then the idea is that Points A and B, those blobs were in contact with one another at some point in the past. Here they are touching, so there's time for them to equilibrate in their temperatures. And then the inflationary epoch begins, and blob A is pushed to one side of the universe, blob B is pushed to the other side of the universe far away, but because they had had time to equilibrate their temperatures, they are the same temperature. You'll see the same kind of radiation. This interactive figure here will allow us to play it out. There's blobs A and B. They're in contact, reaching the same temperature. Here comes inflation. Bam! Other sides of the universe. We haven't yet reached the moment of recombination. That comes at 380,000 years. So we're still going forward in time. Now recombination. That light's allowed to freely stream. And there it comes and reaches us on Earth. The micro microwaves from A are of a similar spectrum as the microwaves from B. Why is the overall density of the universe so close to this critical density? We've talked in general relativity about how curvature of space-time makes things move. And so if you talk about flat space, what you're talking about is space where 
overall, there's no local gravitational sources that are pulling you in any one direction. And so this plane up at the top here is representing flat space. And the geometry class that you took in high school teaches you that the sum of the interior angles inside of a triangle is 180 degrees. But they often don't remind you or mention that that's true on a flat plane, right? Here we see the triangle, the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. You can make a triangle on other surfaces that aren't flat. Like here, take this sphere here as an example. Let's say that you're here at the North Pole and you walk all the way down to the equator. I'm gonna go even larger than the triangle shown here before you make a left-hand turn. And if you're making a left-hand turn, turning onto the equator, that's a 90 degree turn. Let's say you walk 90 degrees around the earth and then you make a, another left-hand turn. That's a second 90 degree angle. And you come up to the North Pole from a direction that's 90 degrees away from the direction you had previously left the North Pole. So there's a third 90 degree angle. And 90 plus 90 plus 90 is 270. It's not 180. So if you make the equivalent of a triangle on this curved surface, you get um, the sum of the interior angles to be larger than 180. In fact, the larger the triangle, the more the sum of the interior angles will be. Here, if you make a triangle on a saddle surface like this, or it kind of looks like a Pringles potato chip, then the sum of the angles turns out to be less than 180 degrees. And it turns out that our universe is most like this. Over large distance scales, if you were to make a big triangle out there in the universe and measure the sum of the interior angles, it'd be 180 degrees. You wouldn't have to have had a universe that way. One could imagine a universe which was more like this or even more like that. And in that case then, uh, you would say you don't have this fat, flat universe, you have the curved universe. Now we're gonna be connecting the curvature of the universe to the density of the universe. There's gonna be a critical density and it'll turn out to within experimental measurements, the um, density of the universe is right at the critical value to make it flat. Had the universe been more dense than that, then we would have what's called a closed universe. Look how the sphere closes in on itself. Or if the density was less than that critical value, you would have what's called an open universe. So why does inflation um, predict or explain that we have a flat universe? Well, let's imagine that you start with a universe that's not flat. Maybe it's spherical, a closed universe like this. You have to imagine that you're the ant that's walking on the surface of this expanding balloon. And at first the balloon is of a moderate size, but after inflation, it becomes very big very quickly. And now you're still the ant walking on the surface of this balloon, but it's a lot harder to measure the deviation away from flatness. Down here, you're the ant, and you could make a triangle on the balloon and figure out that it's uh, not 180 degrees for the sum of the angles and that, oh man, uh, I must not be living on a flat surface. Up here, the surface has expanded so much that it's no longer easy to do the experiments and see that your surface is not flat. It's so expanded that it, it is very close to being flat. And indeed, that seems to be the way our universe is as well. As far as we can tell, it's perfectly flat. It may be ever so slightly away from not flat, but it is uh, darn close. And any deviation that there would have been would have been even larger in the past, which makes us think that it is actually very close to the critical density. Now, as the years have gone by, there have been better and better satellites for measuring this cosmic microwave background radiation. Starting with the COBE satellite circa 1990, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe um, in the early 2000s, and most recently the Planck satellite. And you can see that the resolution has been getting better and better and better which, with each progressive measurement of this CMB. 
Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the fluctuations in that cosmic microwave background radiation. If you look here, you can see, you know, the different colors are representing um, slight variations in the temperature from the hottest to the coolest regions, from the reds to the blues. And what you can do is you can look at how big those fluctuations are in the sky. This horizontal axis here is a measure of angular separation on the sky. So when we're on the left side of this, we're talking about an angular separation between two points on the sky that are far apart, maybe tens of degrees apart. And as you go over to the right side of this diagram, you're talking about two points on the sky that are very close together, small fractions of a degree apart from one another. The main hump right in the middle here corresponds to when points are about one degree apart. So as this traces from left to right, let's like uh, keep in mind the moment when it's crossing this big hump. You see, that's when the fluctuations that we're considering at that moment are one degree apart from one another. And it's actually when you consider two points in the sky that are one degree apart, that's when you're most likely to find a large temperature difference. That's what's being plotted on the vertical axis here, delta T, in micro Kelvin. Micro is 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin. And so we are talking about very small fluctuations, less than 10 to the minus 4 Kelvin, as you go from one position to the other. So the temperature is remarkably close to 2.7 Kelvin everywhere, but it has these small fluctuations about the average. And so notice that if you have big sizes, the temperature difference from one side to the other, two points on the sky, say 90 degrees apart, that temperature difference is rather small, 30 microkelvin. If you take two points on the sky that are one degree apart, then on average their difference delta T might be six, 70 or 80 microkelvin. And then as you get to points that are super close together, it makes sense that their temperatures are nearly the same because they're close enough to maybe have come from the same seed of the universe, the same little region. Okay, so why are we talking about this? Well, the point is the following. This is what we observe, this yellow line right here, right? It's a detailed bit of information about those fluctuations in the sky. And you can take your Big Bang model and you can adjust parameters in it. There are a few free parameters that you can adjust. One of them is, we mentioned before, the percentage of ordinary matter in the universe. And if you take too much matter in the universe, then this first hump here turns out to be too high. Or if you don't take enough, then that first hump is too low. And so what you do is you play around with that parameter in your model until you are fitting the data as best you can. You actually are fitting several parameters all at once. Another parameter that you fit is the dark matter density. And it turns out that that needs to be fit to about 27% the mass energy density in the universe. Um, if you use more than that, then that central hump is too low. If you use less than that, that central hump is too high. So you adjust the parameters in the Big Bang model to explain the observations. Here, I'm showing in the dark, dark dots the WMAP data. These are not yet the most recent data that are available. And the red line here is the so-called consensus model for the Big Bang. And it's more than just this first maximum. You might wonder, what is this maximum from? What, well, what happens is in your universe, um, you have perturbations and things vibrate, right? And these vibrations, the rate at which they vibrate, the frequency can be well described as long as you understand what makes it up. Ordinary matter is going to vibrate at a different rate than dark matter, etc. And so when things are vibrating, they go to a minimum and a maximum and a minimum, right? And when they're at that min or max, they slow down, they stop, and then they go the other way. So if you take a picture of something that's vibrating, maybe it's a mass on a spring, or maybe it's a pendulum that's tick-tocking back and forth. And if you take several pictures at random times, maybe you take 100 random pictures, 
you're more likely going to find that pendulum when it's out near the edges of its swing at the extrema because that's where it's moving slowest. It's moving very quickly right through the center. And so if you just take a picture at a random time, you're not as likely to find it there. So you have all these little blobs of fluid that are oscillating, but at that moment of recombination, 380,000 years into the evolution of the universe, when the light that we're now talking about is released, you'll have a lot of blobs that are reaching their first compression, their first minimum in size. And that corresponds to this first peak here. The blobs are all about one degree, what now turns out to be one degree apart from one another. That's their typical size. So we're measuring the size of these seeds in a sense. This second hump in the spectrum, that corresponds to blobs of a smaller size. Remember, as you go to the right here, you're getting to smaller angles. And those smaller blobs will have oscillated in and out again by that moment. This third maximum corresponds to blobs that are even smaller and the smaller blobs have higher frequencies and they will have by 380,000 years oscillated in and out and then be back in again. What's neat is that as you adjust the parameters in your model, the amount of ordinary matter you have, the amount of dark matter you have and so on, these different peaks are sensitive to different parameters. So like this second peak turns out to be sensitive to the amount of ordinary matter in the universe. The third peak is sensitive to the amount of dark matter you have in the universe. Notice how the model fits these WMAP data quite nicely. However, out here, the WMAP data start to have these large error bars. These very small angles were starting to get below the resolution of WMAP. But now let's change it. And instead of looking at the WMAP data that have these larger error bars, look at the Planck data. You can't even see the error bars on this plot because they're as large as or smaller than the data points themselves. And look at how well the model, the Big Bang consensus model, fits the data. I mean, it's remarkable. This is a wonderful piece of evidence for believing in a Big Bang, right? How could the radiation have this kind of behavior? to have these qualities if there weren't a Big Bang. And so with this WMAP observation, not only do we gain even more confidence, had there been any doubt before, that there was this moment of recombination, we learn about um, fundamental quantities in the universe, like how much of it is made up of ordinary matter, how much of it is made up of dark matter. So what we find um, is that the universe is almost 5% ordinary matter, dark matter is about 27%, and dark energy um, is 68%. Now the sum of these things is 100%. We'll be talking in the next chapter more about exactly what dark matter and dark energy are. And the universe here is um, in this Big Bang consensus model that describes these and other observations, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So everything about this model is in excellent, excellent agreement with um, other independent observations. Um, we'll talk about how galaxies form very quickly and galaxies can form quickly if there is this um, underlying weakly interacting massive particle streams that exist which may very well make up this dark matter that we're talking about here. All right, well, we'll, as I said, be talking about dark matter and dark energy more very soon, but to preview it, dark matter is like ordinary matter in the sense that it gravitationally pulls in other things, but unlike ordinary matter, it does not emit light. Dark energy is a type of anti-gravity material that's going to cause expansion of the universe. So what have we learned? We've learned that the seeds of the universe um, can be explained by this cosmic microwave background radiation, the seeds that form clusters of galaxies and galaxies, and that 
these seeds um, are consistent with our Big Bang model uh, and inflation, with an, including an inflationary epoch. I was at a talk by Alan Guth, who is the person who put forth originally this inflation idea. Uh, back in 1998, I was at the talk, and here are two different quotes of his that stuck with me. I had a recording of the talk, so I dug them up for you that you can read at your leisure. Okay, in the final section of chapter 17, we talk about what's known as Olber's paradox. And in the next few slides, I'm going to be making an analogy between trees and stars. Here on the left, imagine that you're in a woods, and in this woods, the trees are densely packed enough and the woods is large enough that any direction you look out, you're guaranteed to see a tree trunk. And that's like what would be the case if you're here, the observer at the center of this image, and you had an infinite static unchanging universe and you looked out in any direction, at some point you would see a star. And so what Ober said was, why is the night sky dark? That's the paradox. We're so used to thinking about the night sky being dark that it doesn't seem paradoxical, but it is, right? Because if the universe is infinite, that means stars go out forever, it's unchanging, they've been there forever, and everywhere the same, that means it's just as densely packed stars are in one place as another, then any direction you look will ultimately hit a star. You might say, oh, I'm not convinced because as I look at a star far away, it's going to be really dim. And, and that's true, but the light from that dim star, it falls off like 1 over r squared, but the number of stars at that distance are scales like, grows like r squared. And so the dimness is scaling like 1 over r squared multiplied by the number by r squared, you get a constant. So out at any radius, you have a constant contribution to the brightness. And in the end, you get um, a sky which is entirely white. So if instead you live in a universe which doesn't satisfy those criteria that I mentioned, but say maybe has a finite lifetime to it, it's only been around for a certain number of years, 13.8 billion, well then there's the opportunity to look out in a direction and get to a place where there no longer are any stars. It's analogous to being in a wooded region where you can look out in between the stars and see the emptiness between them. So this picture is analogous to our night sky, right? Where you can look out and see in some direction galaxies, analogous to the tree trunks, and in other directions, the emptiness, where essentially you're seeing all the way back to recombination in a sense, um, all the way back to near the beginning of the universe. So if there were no Big Bang, if the universe were infinite and static and unchanging, this is what the sky would look like, analogous to this deeply wooded forest. But the universe is like this, um, because the answer to Olber's paradox is that the universe is not infinite and static and unchanging. Okay, well, that's all that we have in terms of the material. Today's reading quiz answer is going to be, where did it all come from? For millions of years, people have been asking, where did it all come from? The cavemen, the cave people, and now we have better experiments, better observations, but we can ask the same underlying question. In the final few minutes, what I wanted to show you is a neat little tool. Some of you are probably interested in being able to do some hunting of the night sky. And there's this really nice webpage, heavens-above.com. And if you go to it, you can use it as an anonymous user. However, you can set up a free account and they don't spam you with email. There's nothing that, they don't track you. Um, there's nothing that has come bad 
from having set up an account. So I'd encourage you to set up an account. Um, that way you'll be able to plug in your longitude and latitude. I've plugged in the longitude and latitude of Newton Observatory at Allegheny's campus here. And there's a few different neat things that you can check out. So for example, let's say you wanna know when and where to look for the International Space Station. Well, here this week from Meadville, um, it's not gonna be visible. But if I go to next week, um, starting on April 25th, um, I've got a whole, uh, whole slew of events that I can look for. Now these are all morning time events, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and so on. And then if we go forward in time some more, eventually you might be able to find where uh, you have some evening events to look for this. So here's one, for example, where at 22.37, so that's 10.37 p.m., it'll start to be up above the horizon far enough that you can see it on May 15th. At 1041, it's gonna be 72 degrees above the horizon. And you can click here and get an idea of the, where it's going to pass. And on this diagram, you're looking inside of this circle here at the whole sky. And so here down at the bottom, that's the direction to the south. And here up the top, that's the direction towards the north. Over here we have the west, and over here we have the east. And that may be backwards from what you expected me to say, but remember, if you're facing towards the south, west is going to be to your right, and east is gonna to be to your left. So if you're facing towards the south, hold this here, uh, the south part at the bottom, and west will be to your right. And you see that this International Space Station is gonna rise up around 1036, and you might not see it until 1039 or so when it's far enough off the horizon, but then over the next few minutes, it'll move across the sky and it'll be rather bright. Um, the previous page tells us how bright you can expect these things to be. We're looking at the May 15th one and notice that the magnitude is negative 3.6. So this is gonna rival the brightness of Venus in the sky. In fact, maybe even be a little bit brighter than Venus. Um, Vega, the star in the Lyra the Harp constellation has a magnitude of zero. And remember, as you go smaller and smaller numbers, you get to brighter and brighter values. So things that are negative are gonna be very easy to see. It's not just the International Space Station though that you can look for. Let's say you don't wanna wait all the way until May 15th to find something interesting to look at. I like using this daily prediction for brighter satellites. And I usually set it to a minimum brightness of three. Uh, that way it's easy to see. If you set it at five, the, unless you're in a really dark part of the, of the United States or world, then you're not gonna be able to see it at five. But now you can look and oh my gosh, look at tonight for example, April 14th. Look at all these Starlink satellites that are gonna come one right after another. Um, you know, thanks Elon Musk. Uh, that's what the new communication satellites that Elon Musk is pointing, uh, putting up in the sky, his, his companies are putting up in the sky. Uh, those are those satellites. So you can go and you can look for those one right after another. Let me try to find, um, these are all kind of dim to be honest, right around four magnitudes. They're gonna be a little bit tricky to see, but for the sake of argument, let's go ahead and look. And you can see this one's coming from the southeast to the northwest. The next one is gonna just come right in line after it. And you're gonna get a whole slew of these. Oh, this one's coming, I'm sorry. They're coming from the northwest to the southeast and you're gonna get a whole slew of these, one right after another, um, moving across the sky. So if you're looking for satellites, that's fun to do. Of course, astronomers are concerned that this is going to, and has already started to, uh, get in the way of their observations. Now that you're so good at uh, knowing constellations in the sky, you can also look for other things in these, like here's the Orion the Hunter, and here's Gemini the Twins. So this satellite's gonna cut right between Orion and Gemini, and it's gonna be a little bit closer to the horizon than Venus is. So there's different things that you can look for. If I were going out in the sky, uh, out tonight to look at the night sky, 
I would try to look for the ones that were brightest here. Let me hit the update button so that I get a shorter list. So something like this, 1.6, this is at 9 p.m. So it's already enough past sunset time that you'd probably be able to see it. The further you wait past sunset, the easier it's gonna to be to see. It's gonna be nice and high in the sky, 83 degrees. Um, and so this USA 186 satellite, that would be a good one to look for tonight. Um, it's gonna be coming from the south, across the sky, almost through the zenith point, and then to the north. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. Um, I hope you're staying safe. Take care.